London and the Center for Asia Pacific Strategy in Washington, DC, I'd like to express sincere gratitude to exceptional panelists from the United Kingdom and the Republic of Korea, and our distinguished audience from various nations for sharing valuable time, insights, and caring to discuss about the regional stability. I am Hyun Kim, President and CEO of the Center for Asia Pacific Strategy and my partner, Professor Greg Kennedy, director of the Corbett Center at King's College London will join us soon. Today is very meaningful for both organizations because it is our first collaborative symposium after we signed MOU early this year to work together to focus on strategic policy solutions in the defense and security in the Asia Pacific region. CAPS and Corbett Center have a lot in common that we both focus to provide practical and strategic policy recommendations to governments, and we value alliance and coalition partnerships in the Asia Pacific region. Today, we discuss about three topics, general security concern, trade, and maritime security in the Asia Pacific under the theme, Global Maritime Britain and the Republic of Korea as Asia Pacific partners. Each topic will be presented from Korean panelists and the UK panelists. And it is such great timing that we discuss these topics right after the Prime Minister Boris Johnson and the President Moon Jae-in had a bilateral talk at the UN General Assembly three days ago here in the United States. Two leaders had an agreement on the strong relationship between the UK and the Republic of Korea distinctly in trade and defense as exemplified by the recent visit of the UK's carrier strike group to South Korea. I believe our six panelists from both nations will provide us with each nation's firsthand perspective and insight on the current situation and the future partnership prospect. Now let us move to our tremendous mem panel member, uh, introduce, I'm sorry, let us move to our tremendous experts discussion. So I'd like to introduce our panel members for the first topic, regional security concerns in the Asia Pacific. Dr. Shin Bomchol, he, uh, he, uh, he is now a director of Center for Foreign Affairs and Security at Korea Research Institute for National Secure uh, Strategy. Previously, he served as Director General for Policy Planning at MOFA, uh, which is um, two-star general equivalent. And also he served as Policy Advisor to Minister of Rock Defense Ministry. And he is one of the respected and famous leading opinion leaders in Korea. So thank you for participating in our symposium today. And next, our uh, UK panelist is Dr. Ramon Pacheco Pardo. He is head of the Department of European and International Studies at King's College London. And he is participated, he has participated in Trek 1.5 and 2 dialogues with South Korea, North Korea, China, and Japan. And Professor Pacheco Pardo has testified before the European Parliament and advised the OECD, the European External Action Service, and the South Korean MOFA, and the UK's Cabinet and Foreign and Commonwealth Offices. He is a frequent media commentator on Northeast Asian affairs and EU-East Asia relations. Uh, now, shall we uh, uh, start the presentation? Maybe start with uh, Dr. Shin Bumcher. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Kim, for your kind introduction. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Admiral Kim and Professor An, and my colleagues, uh, friends of uh, UK. It is great honor to make a presentation uh, this afternoon, probably in early in the morning UK. Uh, my chosen topic is the uh, security perspective in the Asia Indo-Pacific. I, I will focus on the China and North Korea. Uh, as you know, that there are many issues 
uh, caused by Chinese uh, offensive diplomacy these days. Uh, so one of three of them are most uh, unique. One is the Taiwan Strait, second is the South China Sea, and third one is a North Korea related issue. As we all know that uh, China, uh, uh, as it becomes a big economic power, uh, its uh, foreign policy is more offensive and unilateral. In particular, country like South Korea, uh, China is our just a neighbor. Uh, so we have a great affection in many ways, not only political, but also uh, diplomacy and most importantly, economically. Uh, so South Korea's position is uh, very unique. Traditionally, uh, we are very uh, careful uh, when uh, Korean government made a comment on China, uh, uh, particular uh, as after experience of uh, third uh, economic retaliation um, in 2016, South Korea has kind of a tendency that not speak against on China's position. That is a kind of a bad uh, practice in South Korea's uh, diplomacy. On the other hand, because of this uh, government uh, practice, the anti-China sentiment in Korean people has grown. Uh, so more than 74% of Korean people has uh, some degree of anti-Chinese sentiment. That's another aspect. Anyway, if uh, I return to the security issue, uh, we have uh, three major issues, as I mentioned, uh, Taiwan issue, uh, Taiwan Strait. Uh, uh, China uh, made a more offensive uh, behavior, not only diplomacy, but also military. Uh, so the China does many military drills uh, with, with regard to Taiwan Strait. And the US position is to support Taiwan but as we know that Biden, Biden administration's position is uh, um, not only US, but also other allies and partner uh, work together to uh, stop Chinese uh, offensive behavior in Taiwan Strait. Uh, so United States uh, ask uh, support from Korean government. Uh, traditionally, as I told you that South Korea's position is very neutral on this issue. However, last May, uh, May 21, uh, President Moon Jae-in visited the United States at the summit and uh, the joint uh, agreement of the summit was uh, very great uh, when it comes to Rogue's alliance. For the first time, Korean government uh, mentioned the Taiwan Strait. It's an important issue. Uh, no, before the, uh, May, South Korean government just averted any comment on Taiwan Strait. So that was a kind of a dissatisfaction of a US government when it comes to uh, South Korea's position on China. However, after May, South Korean government made a comment on the Taiwan Strait. And then, uh, but, uh, actually, but uh, although we made uh, such a kind of a wonderful declaration, but real practice is not uh, concrete and detailed. After the summit, South Korea uh, started to avoid the issue of Taiwan Strait. Uh, so uh, last, uh, last week, uh, September 15, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi visited South Korea. At the time, we do not have any comment on the Taiwan Strait. It's kind of another change of position. However, uh, anyway, the US expectation on South Korean role is increasing. However, South Korea is not still ready. Uh, yesterday, our foreign minister, uh, Jong Ngui-yong, uh, made a comment at the New York. Uh, the President Moon visited New York for 76 uh, uh, General Assembly of the United Nations. And then there is an invitation discussion from CFR, Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, the Foreign Minister Jong Yong visited that and made a comment uh, just like that. China is a big country. It has grown up. So it has a certain right to behave offensive. 
it is quite a surprise. And you know, today's major newspaper in South Korea criticized uh, Foreign Minister Jong Yong's position. It's a, it should not be a South Korean government position. It may be a Chinese government position, but in New York, United States, South Korean Foreign Minister made such a bad com comment. I believe that this is because of a North Korean issue. I will explain later, but this kind of flip-flop of South Korea's position, you know, uh, so there is, a, so it is very hard to get the strong support from United States on China issue. Uh, South China Sea issue is almost the same. South Korean government traditionally made uh, uh, some comment of freedom of na navigation and rule of law, uh, respect of rule of law in South China Sea. That is uh, as a user one, uh, but uh, South Korea would not behave, go beyond the, made such kind of a comment. United States uh, probably suggests a joint patrol on South China Sea, but unfortunately, South Korean government did not participate in any kind of a joint patrol in South China Sea. We selectively uh, participate in joint military drill, uh, not directly uh, uh, pointing China. Uh, but anyways, a certain small level of, of uh, joint military drill we have joined. Maybe the Admiral Kim would ex will explain that. So this year we have a joint military drill at uh, Australia and and Alaska, I, I believe. Uh, but uh, South Korea still very careful on do that. Last one is a North Korean issue. Uh, it is a very tricky and very interesting. Although North Korea fired its uh, cruise missile, uh, it's tested its cruise missile and ballistic missile last week, yesterday, uh, the day before yesterday, President Moon Jae-in made a, uh, a speech that it still continued to seek a, a end of war declaration among four partners, uh, North Korea, South Korea, China, and United States. North Korea would not respond to uh, this kind of a declaration since uh, 2018. And China would probably support uh, this kind of a declaration because if the declaration is made, China would probably say the United Nations Command, which was established in 1950, uh, the, after the Korean War break out, the UN Security Resolution 84 uh, provide such a legitimacy to establish such kind of comment, but comment, but the comment itself is limited that uh, defeat North Korea's uh, aggression and restore the peace. So if the declaration is made, China would say that the UNC must dismantle, and then. If the U.S. is dismantled, there is a less legitimacy on the USFK, United States Forces of Korea. So that's the China's strategy. Uh, but South Korea tried to not to focus on that issue, but it instead focusing on the peace process. The United States' position is uh, totally different. Although the uh, spokesman of uh, U.S. Uh, uh, a uh, Pentagon spokesman uh, mentioned uh, this uh, issue last yesterday that U.S. is open to uh, discuss about this declaration. However, however, U.S. position is clear. The declaration is just a political one, not a legal one. And then the declaration should not tackle on the uh, uh, existence of a United Nations command and a USFK. So although South Korea raised the issue of uh, uh, end of war declaration, however, the, the position of each participant is totally different. So it's not easy one. The Korea Peninsula at this moment, North Korea tried to seek uh, to uh, recognize as a de facto nuclear power. So it would not return to the negotiation table. Uh, but uh, the Moon Jae-in administration still to seek a peace process 
and wanted to have a summit, probably at the Beijing Winter Olympic, the February next year. The fe February next year is just uh, before the uh, uh, presidential election of South Korea. Probably time is already up. Okay, I will be very short. Uh, so the Moon administration tried to seek a new dialogue with North Korea. Uh, it tried to uh, persuade uh, China and North United States probably come to Beijing to make uh, such an end of world declaration. That's a present Moon's strategy at this moment. However, uh, it is a uh, uh, risk risky, I think, because at this moment, North Korea would not show its interest to, of uh, denuclearization. So if South Korea uh, stick too much on the restart of negotiation, it might lose its uh, strategic position. This is a uh, current uh, situation in the uh, Indo-Pacific. I fo focused on China issue and North Korea issue, but if you raise uh, another question, I will respond to that. Thank you for your listening. Thank you, Dr. Shin. Uh, the, the, he, he explained us a really comprehensive uh, focus uh, that Korea government and is focusing on. And uh, we'll take the questions after we uh, hear from Dr. Ramon Pacheco Hordo. Thank you. Uh, yep. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for 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 the invitation to join this, uh, this, this panel. I'm very grateful to, to be here. And as you say, it's a very good timing considering the meeting that we had uh, in New York just a couple of days ago. Uh, of course, there have been other developments. Uh, we had a AUKUS being announced a few days ago as well, the EU launching its Indo-Pacific strategy. So what I want to focus on during my presentation is uh, on the regional security concerns uh, in the region, uh, in the Asia Pacific region as per the title of the of the session, uh, but also where does uh, Europe stand in terms of cooperation, potential cooperation with Korea in these issue areas? And uh, this includes, of course, uh, the UK, but also includes uh, France, potentially Germany as well, potentially the, the, the EU as well, because I think when it comes to the strategic interests of uh, European countries and institutions in the Asia Pacific and, and concerns and potential cooperation with Korea, there are uh, many similarities among them. Um, I just spent say, six weeks in, in Korea actually discussing these matters precisely, cooperation between the, the, the two sides. So what I'm going to be talking about builds quite a bit on discussions that, that we had with, with uh, Chongwa the the Ministry of National Defense, MOFA, but also with discussions on the on the European side as much as my, my own analysis. So first of all, I think uh, top of the agenda, uh, and I think Dr. Shin uh, mentioned this, uh, is of course uh, China's uh, behavior, however, where, however way you want to characterize it. Uh, it is very clear that for Korea, for other Asian countries, or for European countries, China is seen as more threatening today than it was uh, five, 10 years ago, or even two years ago, right? So, so there's this, this belief that China has become more assertive and we have to respond to this. Uh, I think it's quite obvious that the position of the Korean government has uh, hardened uh, in recent, re recent months. Uh, the, the joint statement between President Moon and President Biden very clearly pointed out in, in, in the direction of a hardening of views. Uh, some some conservative friends in Korea were telling me, you know, this is a statement that a, Kore a Korean conservative president uh, could have signed, right? When it comes to to, to China, it mentioned the South China Sea, the Taiwan Strait. Uh, of course, then Korea came to the G7 meeting that actually took place in, in Cornwall in the UK, and it joined, uh, it signed the Open Societies statement that very clearly was targeting China as well, as, as much as, uh, as Russia. And there have been discussions between uh, Korea and uh, British officials, French officials, uh, EU officials as well, uh, on, on, on how to deal with, 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 with China's rise. And I think that three areas in which we can see that are of, of concern in the Asia Pacific region, where we, we can see potentially more cooperation with the UK and other European partners. Uh, the first of them is uh, maritime security, uh, very clearly. I think from a, a European perspective, uh, South Korea's uh, participation in, in joint uh, exercises, 
the port calls that are taking place in in, in Pusan in the future in, in in Incheon probably as well with the uh, the the, the um, um, UK aircraft carrier and the uh, German ship going to the region respectively. Uh, the fact that Korea is developing an aircraft carrier uh, uh, by its, uh, in, in and by itself, these are all welcome developments from, from a European perspective. I think there is a realization that, of course, the major power continues to be the US, but the US is trying to build this uh, set of uh, alliances uh, with different partners uh, in the region, and you see European navies. Uh, Working together with, uh, with 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 the U.S., you have of course the Quad. Uh, you have Korea, as I mentioned as well. So you have this set of uh, alliances, partnerships, uh, maybe led by the U.S., but with the participation of many different uh, countries. And this is an area in which I think the European side sees a huge potential for cooperation with the Korean side. Uh, if we look at the EU itself, for example. Uh, there is cooperation in the Gulf of Aden, right? In the Gulf of Aden, uh, where we have UNAP4, and we have participation, uh, cooperation, formal cooperation, actually, uh, we, we, with Korea, the only Asian country that actually has permanent formal cooperation with the EU in this, in this area. And I think when it comes to the UK, we will see more cooperation uh, moving forward. The second area is uh, cybersecurity. Uh, of course, uh, from a European perspective and from a Korean perspective, this is not only about China, it's also about North Korea, it's also about Russia, and they are perceived as being uh, equally uh, threatening. Uh, in the case of Korea, has received cyber attacks from, from the three of them, even if most of them seem to come from, from North Korea. Same for, from the European side, most attacks uh, coming into Europe may come from Russia, but we have also received attacks from, from China and from, from North Korea. So there is a cooperation here, but there is the, the discussions here about how to strengthen uh, cooperation. For example, uh, the, the, the South Korean government has recently taken more seriously the, the cybersecurity threat. You see this in the Ministry of National uh, Defense, as well as, as as well as MOFA. And on the European side, there is a thirst for, for cooperation, how to improve cyber uh, defense uh, capabilities, uh, for example, in cooperation with other countries. And in the case of Asia, the partners are really Korea and Japan uh, when it comes to cyber above uh, any, anyone else. So uh, you see how this can happen uh, between uh, militaries, but also between police forces, uh, government officials, you see these discussions taking place. So for example, uh, uh, Europol and different European police forces are deepening links with South Korean police forces to deal with cyber crimes. And sometimes the boundaries between cyber crimes coming from individuals and states, in the case of China, North Korea, and Russia, pretty much there aren't any, any boundaries in many, in many cases. So these are two areas where, in which they're ripe for, for cooperation between the Korean side and European partners, including the UK. And there is one last area that has come to the fore as a result of recent developments in Afghanistan, uh, which is uh, conflict management. Uh, I think both uh, European um, allies and partners of the US and, and, and Korea and other Asian partners uh, were a bit surprised uh, at the way the withdrawal from, from Afghanistan uh, took place, the US withdrawal from Afghanistan took place. And I think this is uh, quite interesting in terms of potential cooperation between Korea and the UK and other uh, European countries or the EU as well, because the discussions about conflict management in third countries uh, have been very formal uh, up to now. Uh, they were more about expressions of an interest in cooperation between like-minded partners. But what I find very interesting is that since we're in Afghanistan, there has been an acceleration in discussions about how there could be cooperation in a way that could uh, lead to a stronger um, uh, capabilities being deployed by so-called like-minded partners and reducing reliance on the US, not excluding the US, of course, no one is talking about it, but reducing reliance on the US because the US has its own security interests and sometimes they might not be fully aligned with the security interest of uh, Korea, of European countries uh, in this uh, uh, third 
uh, in this in, in these third uh, countries. So uh, as a result of this, we might see more cooperation taking place. And of course, the Asia Pacific region is one in which there are different conflicts and conflict management might take place uh, between uh, the Korean side and, 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 and European partners, especially if we broaden the region and instead of uh, referring to the Asia Pacific only, we broaden it to the Indo-Pacific. So this is the first uh, part of my presentation that I wanted to focus on, the, 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 the potential for cooperation uh, as a result of regional security concerns uh, in the region and the greater interest of the UK and uh, other European countries in getting more involved in dealing with the security issues. Now for the second part, I wanted to focus on the North Korean issue. Uh, which it is fair to say is not as important for the European side, uh, including the UK, as it was uh, in the past. So you saw much more involvement from European countries in dealing with North Korea in the early 2000s, even in the early 2010s. But what you have seen uh, on, in, 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 in London, Paris, in Brussels, different uh, European capitals uh, is the realization that the role that Europe uh, can play is uh, secondary and can only become more important if there is an agreement between North Korea and the US uh, that makes North Korea move towards denuclearization. I think no one thinks that full denuclearization is possible, but it could be an agreement as it has been in the past which North Korea agrees to denuclearization, or maybe we settle for an arms control deal as an interim step towards potential denuclearization. And here's where the European side could actually uh, play a role. And of course, this is of, of uh, um, uh, one of the key security interests, of course, for, for any South Korean president, the current one, but whoever is elected next year will have to continue focus on North Korea, of course. So what will we see is on the European side, three areas in which if there is an agreement between North Korea and the US uh, with the word denuclearization somewhere in the agreement, uh, three roles that the European side could play. First of all, uh, countries such as the UK itself, uh, France uh, uh, as well, Sweden, for example, too, they have uh, expertise in uh, the technical aspects of denuclearization, right? The dismantlement, for example, of nuclear materials, nuclear facilities, even nuclear weapons, the safe transportation and storage of these materials. So from a very technical point of view, if there is an agreement in which North Korea agrees to dismantle some of its nuclear facilities or even nuclear uh, uh, weapons, right? There could be a role for different European experts from different European countries uh, to play. And we have seen, for example, the involvement of uh, British experts when uh, Gaddafi agreed to give up the weapons of mass destruction, Libyan weapons of mass destruction back in the 2000s. So clearly there is a role that uh, the UK and other countries from Europe uh, can actually play. Uh, secondly, uh, as we have seen with the nuclear deal with, with, with Iran, uh, there is the, th the, the potential threat that if there is an agreement between the US and North Korea, one of the two parties might decide to defect from the agreement. In the, in the case of GCPOA, it was the, the US under the Trump administration that decided to withdraw uh, from the agreement. Uh, if there's an agreement between the US and North Korea, it could be the North Korean side, for example, that decided to withdraw from the agreement. Now, from a European perspective, and if we look at GCPOA, this is a UK, France, Germany, plus the European Union that, that play a role. Uh, one of the advantages of having a process that is not necessarily multilateralized, but in which different partners sign or support the agreement, is that the agreement can be maintained while negotiations take place for the party that has left the agreement to come back. And we see this very clearly with Iran. The only reason really why GCPOA survived is because the UK, France, Germany, and, and, and the EU actually push for the agreement to remain in place in the hope that a new US administration would come to office and would decide to potentially rejoin the agreement. And this is precisely what we have seen with the Biden administration, uh, which is now negotiating the potential for the agreement to 
resume the JCPOA agreement. So from a European perspective, and taking into consideration that obviously Iran and North Korea are very different in, in terms of where they are in, in, in the development of the nuclear programs. But from a European perspective, it might make sense if there is an agreement between the US and North Korea for different parties to support the agreement in the hope that if one of the two parties decides to leave the agreement, that this can be maintained for a period of time uh, and then uh, uh, the other party can, this party can rejoin the agreement. Uh, and, and, and thirdly, also from a European uh, perspective, of course, the North Korean nuclear issue is not only about North Korea or the Korean Peninsula. Uh, there is the risk of proliferation from North Korea to the Middle East. We know that North Korea in the past has sold nuclear technology, has sent uh, nuclear scientists to countries in the uh, Middle East and even North Africa as well. So countries such as Iran, uh, Libya, Egypt in the past as well, uh, Syria, all these countries have benefited from North Korean nuclear know-how and nuclear transfers from North Korea. And this is a direct threat to the uh, European uh, continent, right? And, and what happens, for example, if some of this nuclear technology falls in the hands of uh, terrorist groups? This is a real threat that we have been discussing in a European context, right? Uh, what happens if, if some of these, uh, these nuclear materials, for example, are, are used for a dirty bomb that explodes in a European capital? These are actual discussions taking place between security services, police forces uh, across uh, across Europe. So from a European perspective, any deal involving uh, North Korea with the war denuclearization should have a strong safeguards to prevent proliferation from North Korea to the Middle East. And here is another play, another area in which the European countries, UK, France, Germany, the EU itself, other European countries would try to play a role in preventing, making sure that this proliferation doesn't happen, that North Korea actually just stops its uh, proliferation activities, of course, in cooperation with, with, with other partners, in cooperation with, with South Korea, with the US, with Japan, uh, uh, as well, but trying to prevent this from happening. Uh, I don't want to go over my time, so I will leave it there for my initial presentation, and I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was, uh, that was really, really helpful for me to, uh, for people, I think people to understand a little different, but similar but different perspective uh, in terms of the concerns and and focus that, focuses that you think uh, what the security can, um, threat, maybe potential threat are. So I think we'll save the Q&A session uh, toward, toward the end because uh, your this topic is very comprehensive. We could actually uh, match this and then combine this without, with other uh, topics that we're gonna listen in. So uh, this time, uh, if you allow me to introduce, uh, for, to go back, go next to, next to the topic, second topic. So I'd like to introduce our uh, panelists for the second topic on, on the CPTPP. It is too long, too long word, um, comprehensive and progressive agree agreement for trans-Pacific tra partnerships. So we would like to um, hear from this time, maybe we'll go with the UK panelists first and then Korean panelists. So we have, uh, I'm delighted to introduce our UK panelist. He is Dr. David Hennig. He is director of UK Trade Policy Project at European Center for International Political Economy and a leading expert on the development of UK trade policy post Brexit in 2017. He co-founded the UK Trade Forum which brings together UK tra trade policy experts to debate and analyze these issues. Also, he was heavily engaged on TTIP throughout the three and a half a year of negotiations, working with both sets of negotiators to develop ways forward, particularly on regulatory coherent TBT and sustainable development. And next, our uh, Korean panelist is Professor An Dok Gun. He is Dean of International Affairs at Seoul National University, and he is also Professor of International Trade Law and Policy at Graduate School of International Studies. And he is Director for International Commerce and Strategy. Professor An has been key advisor to ROC government 
for a long time, still now, still he does on the trade and international economic issues. And he, he has been chair for CPTPP strategic forum. And he also taught at WTO general, uh, regional trade policy course at the World Trade Organization for eight years. And he has lots of awards and publication I cannot really introduce here. It's gonna take so much time. So um, uh, I will uh, pass that on uh, the stage to Mr. David Hannick. Over to you. Yes, <clears throat> thank you for the introduction. And um, uh, please uh, note, this is not my uh, normal office uh, setup, though it is uh, very pleasant uh, where, where I uh, am. Um, CPTBP has become dramatically newsworthy in the last week. Uh, China applied to join last week and yesterday Taiwan submitted an application. The UK had previously submitted an application earlier in the year and is starting to go through an accession process. And this is really creating a lot of complexity and what I want to talk about is the CPTPP as a trade agreement. The UK in the way we are approaching it, but also the way in which we might approach it, and how the UK and Korea may wish to work together on trade as part of a broader partnership. Now, I should say at the outset that it isn't clear yet that the UK's trade and foreign policy after leaving the EU is fully mature. I would say it isn't, in fact. Um, we're still thinking very carefully, or in, in many instances, about exactly how to balance our new freedoms on, on trade policy, our own neighbourhood uh, in, in Europe, uh, traditional alliances in North America, and the emerging Indo-Pacific strategy. In that sense, I don't think we are unique in trying to balance all of those uh, areas. And obviously, it's also... Um, complicated to be considering the, um, the the rise of China and how our economic interaction is with China. China is not our major trading partner. Uh, the EU remains our major trading partner. We do around 50% of trade with Europe, followed by North America at around 15 to 20%. Nonetheless, uh, these are big and important questions, and clearly there is a sense of a strategy around uh, the phrase global Britain. The UK does want to show, or the UK government wants to show that we um, are an increasing force around the world after leaving the, the EU, but it's not clear how that will work out. And consideration of China um, is a, a good lead in to thinking about the CPTPP or the Trans-Pacific Partnership as it started. And I think that this has, been two different kinds of trade agreements in it, or three perhaps in its um, history. And I think it's important to recognize that we're still not sure which it is. The first was an exercise in regional integration led by New Zealand and Singapore primarily, um, and started as a, a small group of countries wanting to, to deepen their own integration. Um, and that, that's the, the origins in the late 2000s were on that then the us showed an interest as, as did a number of other countries and we it became a 12 country negotiation which with the us at the same time negotiating the transatlantic trade and investment partnership that i was involved in was very much seen as a china containment um measure so the idea was that the us would form strong economic ties with both europe and the Asia, the Asia Pacific, through the two trade agreements, that they would be different in nature, but essentially they would help for uh, the US and friends and allies to set the standards and regulations of the future. Clearly, that didn't happen. Um, the US, uh, with TPP became controversial in the US and it was an election topic in the 2016 presidential election, even after the text had been finalized and the US had signed. And then the TTIP failed to, uh, had not quite progressed so far, though it was a deeper agreement, um, and um, essentially uh, stalled 
after the election of President Trump. And after the election of President Trump, he also pulled out of TPP, at which point it was recast as the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement. And it became more like the economic integration that it had originally been between the 11 countries of the uh, of the CPTPP, of whom only of which only seven have so far ratified. Nonetheless, with such an economic agreement, that is of great interest to um, countries in the region and countries around the world. It's certainly of interest to the UK, looking around for what we may do um, after Brexit. Obviously, it has also been of interest to countries in the region. Now. The CPTPP is not a particularly high standard trade agreement, as is often stated. The, it does have provisions in the areas such as state-owned enterprises, uh, environment and labor law, but these are not particularly onerous. Some have suggested that China would struggle to meet the criteria. Others, however, on seeing it, think that that would not be so much of a problem. Um, and. Vietnam has already uh, joined, has certain um, 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 easements on the on the provisions, and certainly there is every reason for China to believe that they could join, and this would be part of China's economic integration. And similarly, we have, of course, seen in the last year the signing of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership um, invo involving uh, ASEAN countries and also East, East, East Asian countries and China and Korea and Japan, plus New Zealand and Australia. Um, and so we see a move towards economic integration, but there is also a China element. And for the UK, there are, again, two elements. There is an element which is the economic benefit. It is not significant. We have trade agreements with most of the countries concerned, as indeed we do already with Korea. Um, and the extra economic benefit of the Trans-Pacific Partnership is quite limited, less than 0.1% of GDP in terms of growth. But the opportunity to work potentially to deepen relations with like-minded countries, and many of the most like-minded countries globally uh, for the UK are in the CPTPP, um, and I'm here where we're thinking, I would be thinking about New Zealand, I'd be thinking about Singapore, Chile perhaps, um, Australia perhaps a little less, Japan certainly, and in that sense I would also want to add in Korea and say okay this is a potentially a interesting club of like-minded countries who could come together and help to if you like um, influence the larger powers in global trade such as China the EU and the US but this now becomes more complicated with China seeking to join and I think the worry and I think what has overtaken us in the last week is that whereas um, previously, I would have said the CPTPP is a very good idea for the UK. It will help us to s strengthen the idea that we will, can use trade agreements as a foundation of our alliances with uh, like-minded countries that we can replace, not replace perhaps in, in quite the same way, the, um, some of the political aspects of the EU with um, closer relations with CPTPP countries and in the hope that Korea would see the possibility of joining. This now becomes much more complex. I am no longer sure, and I think that we have to think very deeply now about whether CPTPP really can be that basis for the UK's Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, it has been very fast moving. I am not sure how the CPTPP member countries will consider uh, the new accession countries. I think it is very difficult for them. Uh, there is not a... Uh, separate full-time CPTPP secretariat. It is lodged within the New Zealand government. I do not um, envy their job in having to think now what they do about um, handling the, the, uh, the accession processes of the different countries involved. It could indeed be tricky for the UK. Um, I will leave it at this point. I won't, with apologies, be able to stay for the entire uh, uh, of this uh, of, of this fascinating discussion, but I will be obviously listening with great interest to what Professor Ahn has to say uh, as well on this subject. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Hennig. 
thank you for your time. And I actually like your background so much. It gives uh, the feeling of UK, <laughs> I like it. <laughs> so um, yes, uh, so I think we will, um, we will go, go to Professor An's uh, presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, it was an excellent point. Uh, for CPTPP, um, actually, uh, at the beginning uh, of the negotiation, Korea had a big challenge uh, about whether to join this negotiation. We were actually invited by US government to join this negotiation, but the Korean government decided not to join uh, CPTPP at that time, mainly because of two reasons. The first one was uh, China-Korea FTA. At the time, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the President Obama uh, described the TPP as basically economic weapon, uh, economic entrap entrapment of China uh, with this uh, the strategic alliance of like-minded countries. Because of this description, the China made it clear to Korea that you should join either Korea-China FTA or TPP. At that point in time, Korea had to join, had to choose uh, China-Korea uh, FTA because uh, China becomes a larger and larger market for Korean industry sector. Plus, the, the second reason was uh, we actually had huge political difficulty to ratify Korea-US FTA negotiations. Uh, it took a long time uh, to conclude Korea-US FTA, but much longer time was required to ratify uh, the Korea's FTA. As you may know, uh, because of the political controversy in the United States, as well as in Korea, we had a really hard time, especially uh, in Korea, the, the, uh, the new government at the time, the present Lee Myung-bak government, uh, did kind of the mistake uh, to handle the, the beep trade issue. Uh, he casually thought that he could give this beep market to expedite the ratification of Korea USFTA, but that decision basically inflamed the whole, the Korean uh, general public. So at the time the government almost kicked out of the <laughs> office and we had huge demonstration in the middle of uh, the downtown in, in Seoul for uh, uh, almost a couple of months. And then uh, when we had this chance to join TPP, the Korean government basically thought that, well, we just went through difficult political procedure to ratify FTA with the United States and then not again, no more. So uh, that was uh, basically main reason. And then another uh, difficult challenge was how to arrange FTA with Japan. That was a big challenge for us. So uh, with this uh, issue, uh, Korea at the time uh, did not uh, uh, join the TPP negotiation, but that actually costed us a, a, a huge uh, uh, loss because uh, the chorus FTA, probably that was kind of the the last and the culmination of kind of the old fashioned FT arrangement. A completely new version of modern style FT began with TPP. Korea basically lost the chance to join this TPP uh, style modern uh, economic arrangement. Um, so uh, that was a big, big challenge. Uh, now, uh, everyone tried to join TPP as they uh, uh, explained China, even Taiwan. Actually, Taiwan uh, was very, very eager to join uh, TPP uh, from a long time ago. Uh, in, in this part of the world, when we had RCM negotiation and TPP negotiations, 
were in progress, the Taiwanese government uh, actually tried to join TPP. Uh, they uh, politically tried to provoke two major FT negotiations, but they knew that because of the Chinese opposition, uh, the chance to join RCEP is really, really slim. So uh, their final uh, calculation was by provoking this uh, two uh, uh, FT negotiation, uh, they had kind of uh, the agreement with China and then they tried to join actually TPP negotiation by uh, sacrificing the RCEP opportunity. But now, a whole situation has been completely changed. The Korean government actually showed uh, and uh, clarify the intention to join CPTP early this year. President Moon Jae-in uh, made it clear that we had a strong uh, intention to join CPTP, although we did not uh, uh, make the former accession uh, application uh, yet. Um, but now, uh, in, in Korean side, our situation has been dramatically changed. We signed the RCEP negotiation, and for RCEP, uh, China ratified it, even Japan ratified RCEP, and probably uh, early next year, probably the Korean government will also uh, ratify RCEP negotiation. That means uh, between Korea and China, uh, Japan, uh, one of the most controversial uh, economic relationship uh, we had uh, may be, uh, the, the formerly uh, concluded under the auspice of RCEP uh, negotiation. It becomes the first ever uh, the former FT arrangement between Korea and Japan. At the current stage, we the, the, the Japan actually made a lot of exception against uh, the Korea against uh, China. So bilaterally speaking between Korea and Japan, uh, the China versus uh, Japan, uh, the, the FT arrangement uh, doesn't mean much uh, under uh, RCEP. So uh, we actually need the, the further uh, economic cooperation probably with the CPTPP. Um, CPTPP is completely different animal. Um, for us, we are actually uh, substantially uh, prepared. Um, as uh, the President Kim mentioned, I actually worked as uh, the chair for TPP Strategic Forum since 2015. So Korean government actually prepared for a long time to join uh, this, this initiative if uh, necessary. Um, but still we have a lot of uh, challenges. For example, in terms of the market access, uh, on, on its appearance, it, it looks very easy game because we already have uh, the FT with most of the, the, the TPP partners, CPTPP partners, only except for Japan and Mexico. But uh, the problem is for Japan, for example, Japan has no industrial tariff. The Japan is one of the most open country, open uh, developed country. Uh, when they had the trade uh, controversy with the United States during the 1980s and 1990s, basically it uh, dismantled most of the, the trade barriers already. So it's completely free countries. It has relatively high agricultural tariff, but nothing for industrial tariff. That means for us, when we have a tariff with Japan, it was almost a unilateral trade liberalization against Japan. Um, also, with other countries, New Zealand, Australia, Vietnam, and uh, those ASEAN countries, we already have FTA, but we actually left out uh, most politically controversial agriculture tariff there. It was very difficultly won exceptions. When we joined CPTPP, we have to open that sector. So, <laughs> For us, basically we left out all the difficult challenges and then we have to now open this one. <laughs> so for, from the, the Minister of Trade's point of view in Korea, this is really, really difficult situation. 
In terms of the rule uh, uh, for CPTPP, we still have a lot of challenge for state-owned enterprise, digital trade, and uh, sanitary, phytosanitary and technical variations. So um, the, the state-owned enterprise issue, I don't think that China can actually finish the accession negotiation in any foreseeable future. It is one thing for them, for China to apply uh, for a session to CPTPP, but probably it would be a completely different story uh, when they can actually complete the session negotiations. Here, uh, China is not allowed to negotiate the terms and condition for CPTPP. It, it is just a matter of whether they can take it or uh, completely absorb uh, the as given uh, in the current CPTP, but the SOE chapter alone can raise huge, huge issue. Also, uh, the digital trade chapter, e-commerce chapter, the China still block the, the Facebook and Google, but then they have to allow the, the data free flow, and then they have to the, uh, dismantle uh, the server localization, that kind of thing will raise really, really difficult uh, uh, the, the policy issue for Chinese government. So uh, those are still the issue uh, probably they have to think about. And we, the Korea also uh, is uh, the struggling to complete. But, but uh, in any case, in, well, basically the CPTPP is, the, is the, the direction we are heading for. Korea is actually preparing for this, this uh, uh, direction because actually we know that this is not the ultimate goal. Maybe uh, not under the, the, the first uh, the term of the President Biden, but in case Biden's administration uh, will come back to this Asia Pacific region and then try to propose the Biden version of the TPP not uh, the CPTPP, then uh, I don't think that the, the, the Korea can lose that chance. We have to join uh, that opportunity. Then uh, we probably, at that point in time, probably the arrangement, uh, the trade rule, the trade order will be based on, we believe, uh, uh, not just on the CPTPP, but probably based on the, U the USMCA, uh, which is much higher a uh, uh, level of the economic, the, uh, the cooperation, or even uh, the solidarity. So the, in, in that regard, as David uh, alluded, the Korea and uh, UK, I hope, uh, work together to, to establish the industry infrastructure and uh, the, the, the economic uh, the environment, especially to deal with the digital transformation and uh, the democratic, the technology alliance, that becomes really a hot topic for uh, the EU, UK, and many leading countries nowadays. Probably I should, I should stop here. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, Professor Ahn. This, this was a really, really interesting and really fun discussion. And uh, I, before we let uh, Mr. Hanek go, uh, we will be very, very missed. <laughs> but we're going to have a Q&A session in the end. And uh, we have our uh, Professor Kennedy here. Um, and I, I think uh, maybe we can have another uh, in-person session on this, uh, not, not only CPTPP, but this economic cooperation uh, aspect. I wish we could have in-person meeting, maybe next year, anytime that we can travel with this whole same panelist, if you are uh, scheduled allow later. It'll be really- CPTPP uh, will be going anywhere anytime soon, will it? I, I mean, I think we'll, I think it's a, a very solid thread for CAPS and the Corbett Center to continue to stay on top of, because um, as both the speakers have alluded to, there's there's a lot of ground yet to be covered, and there's a long way to go in both the journeys. So, I think I think you're exactly right, he and we'll end up we'll end up back again, hopefully, in in face to face. 
Yes, yes, that would be great. So whether you want to do in UK or Seoul or, or in Washington DC, it's up to your preference. We have all the options. And uh, I'll be, uh, uh, Mr. Hanek, do you have any last word before you take off? Yes, my, uh, my apologies that I do have to uh, to, to 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 leave the uh, the call. But it's very interesting from a, a Korean point of view as well, and I think that what that um, tells me really is that there is scope here for the UK with Korea and with others to develop deeper trade dialogues and I think not just government to government but I think at this level as well with academics and experts and practitioners and that I think that we do need to develop these deeper dialogues to understand the direction of global tr uh, trade and how we can work together. CPTPP may be the excuse to do that it may not be the final result of it and I think we should be careful to distinguish those maybe and that is what the last week has taught us is that maybe don't rely on CPTPP as the for venue for our for future discussions between the UK and Korea thank you yeah. and my apologies for having to leave. thank you very much <clears throat> thank you very much David um, really appreciate that and uh, taking the time to help us to be able to raise the awareness here in the UK because I think you know as as you've indicated the need for UK elements to be more aware of Korea as opposed to the traditional kind of views of Japan and Australia and China, I think uh, are gonna be important. So thank you very much, much appreciated. Okay, thank you. Uh, so shall we uh, move to the our third uh, final topic? Uh, it is about uh, you know, the impact and influence of UK Carrier Strike Group for the strategic relations between the Republic of Korea and the United Kingdom. It is a really exciting topic. Uh, I think that there are many uh, news coverage in Korea after the visit. And there was also MND, uh, the Ministry of uh, National Defense, the International Division Chief. He actually very in detail explained how great experience that that was. Uh, today, we have our panelists from Korea, uh, Rear Admiral Kim Jin Hyung, who graduated of the Rock Naval Academy in 1982. And actually, he graduated from a variety of institutions, such as OBC at US Army Chemical School and Rock Naval War College and U.S. Naval War College. And he is a significant Navy assignment as ashore, includes as an aide to the Minister of National Defense and as a Chief of Protocol Officer to the CNO. He also served as the Naval Attaché to the Embassy of the Republic of Korea in the U.S. for about three years. And as a Flag Officer, Real Admiral Kim served as a Secretary of National Crisis Management in Blue House, which is the, uh, the office of president. Afterwards, he served as a commander at the first fleet of ROC Navy and director of strategic planning, J-5, at uh, ROC Joint Chief of Staff. And his final assignment was commander in Navy Logistics Command. Thank you for joining us. And our, our U UK speaker is our Captain Kevin Fleming, from Royal Navy who retired. He is a former Lynx helicopter pilot in, com uh, in command of Maritime Lynx Training Squadron at the UK and also at the UK Defense Academy. He was director of the Royal Navy Division. And also he served as the UK Defense Attaché to Brazil. And he is now an international engagement consultant engaged in various regions of the world. Currently, he is engaged in South and South, Southeast Asia, focused on developing blue economies by enhancing their maritime domain awareness. Also, he is a senior research fellow with the Corbett Center. Uh, shall, we, um, shall we move to uh, Real Admiral Kim Jin Hyung's presentation, sir? Thank you very much. Very wonderful introduction of me. So nice to meet you, everyone. So it is great honor to joining this seminar. And today's many, many 
part of today's presentation probably is a little bit overlap, but I would like to talk with uh, the first one is the uh, United Kingdom's Queen Elizabeth's aircraft carrier strike group to visit Korea and China's maritime strategy and Korea strategy of choice and conclusion. So especially, I would like to thank the chairperson Eun Hee Kim and King's College for hosting this event. First one, British carrier strike group visit Korea. This year in August, a British newest aircraft carrier, the Queen Elizabeth carrier strike group came to Korea. It consists of eight warship, destroyers, frigates, support ships, and submarines. Even during the Korean War, the United Kingdom sent a large numbers of troops and warship to help defend Korea's freedom and democracy. The United Kingdom dispatched the second combat unit after the United States. And diplomatic efforts were made to cooperate with the establishment of the United Nations forces, including the Commonwealth countries. On June 27, 1950, the United Kingdom expressed support for the UN Security Council proposal for military aid to South Korea. And the next day, decided to send a ship from the Far East Fleet Station in Hong Kong. Accordingly, the Royal Navy dispatched a fleet of eight warships on June 29 including one light aircraft carrier, two cruisers, three destroyers, and three frigates. It was about the same size as the carrier strike group that came to Korea this time. Afterward, the light carrier Invincible in 1992 and the light carrier Illustrate in 1997 visited Korea. However, this is the first time that has conducted joint exercise with the South Korean Navy. The aircraft carrier Elizabeth held a public event in the water of Busan before the exercise, inviting key South Korean officials. Then until September 1st, they conducted naval maneuver and tactical training with the South Korean Navy in the East Sea for two days. Captain James Blankmore, commander of the carrier wing, who met with the reporters about King Elizabeth on the same time, said about the reason for the training in the East Sea of the Korean Peninsula, it is most important for the British Navy to conduct operation on the global stage. So the South China Sea, like any other sea, must be free to sail and train for the British Navy with its allies and friendly country, he said. At the end of May, the Queen Elizabeth Carrier Strike Group, which left the United Kingdom and toured the Indo-Pacific region, conducted joint exercise with the United States Carrier Strike Group in the East and the South China Sea and trained with many countries. British Defense Secretary Ben Wallace referring to the development of Queen Elizabeth in a meeting with Defense Minister Seoul in July. He said, this will be a largest naval and air force deployment from the British mainland in 30 years. We plan to deploy two warships at all times in this area, he explained. The war is the China's military expansion. China's maritime strategy is changing from coastal defense in the early day of the establishment of the military to aggressive maritime strategy with national gloves. Since the Inauguration of Xi Jinping has promoted 
the construction of a naval power through the one belt, one road policy and the Paul Nicholas strategy to secure maritime traffic route and base ports, thereby securing overseas military base to secure maritime traffic route and expanding national power. China has challenged the United States multi dominance capability in the Western Pacific with its powerful A to AD strategy, which includes modernized naval and air forces, long range attack missile, and space and cyber electronic warfare technologies. However, the Chinese Navy is now going beyond the A to AD strategy to deter the United States Navy for conducting bilateral or multilateral joint level exercise with the naval forces of allies and partner countries in the region. The South China Sea and the Taiwan Strait. Now, China carrier battle group and expeditionary strike group are being developed for similar maritime control operation. Currently, following the Liaoning and Sangdong carrier, carrier number three, which will be equipped with Caterpillar type takeoff and landing aircraft is on the construction and the type O75 large amphibious assault ship Haina has been deployed to the Southern, Southern Threat Command. In the near future, the Chinese Navy is expected to sending carrier battle group similar to the United States Navy, CSG and ESG to the Indo-Pacific Ocean. After all, this means that Chinese Navy is changing to an offensive military strategy rather than defensive military strategy that was limited only to the A to AD strategy in the past. Therefore, China's maritime hegemony strategy to expand its international political influence in the, in the Pacific is a realistic threat to most country in East Asia. However, the prevailing opinion is that it is still insufficient to deter the United States maritime power. And one example, according to reports such as the British Daily Express in August, the British carrier frigate Kent and Richmond tracked on discover two Chinese 7,000 ton Shang class nuclear powered submarine with sonar. The Chinese submarine were caught while following the British carrier group. China is North Korea's traditional sponsor. It does not play a special role. Chinese is North Korea the nuclearization issue. China wants to use North Korea to withdraw U.S. forces from Korea and completely remove U.S. influence from Korean Peninsula. Ultimately, China wants to include the Korean Peninsula within its sphere of influence. China overtly exert its influence over Korea and is acting close. In 2016, while China was monitoring South Korea in detail with its radar, it even took economic retaliation against South Korea deployed that US FK side. The relation is that China traditionally demand of Korea is not mutual equality between countries. In April 
2017, there was a summit between President Trump and President Xi Jinping. At this time, President Xi Jinping said, Korea actually used to be a part of China. It shows the true heart of China. China has been make, making free country request for repair of Korean Navy and maritime police petrol vessel that have been operating in the high sea of Korean West Sea since about 10 years ago. Similarly, there is a demand from the China side to evict Korean maritime survey vessel that are conducting ocean exploration in the East China Sea and the West Sea and the South Sea of Korea. China also seeks control over South Korea and South and West Sea. What is worried is that in the near future, effort to make South Korea's South and West Sea into China's inland sea will be in full swing. China is blocking US military power in the Indo-Pacific and based on its military initiative, it pursued China's Sino-centrism by making neighboring country at the level of semi-semi-domestic satellites. Korean strategic choice. Korea is a representative export-led country. Nearly 99% of trade is done by sea. In particular, as most of its energy, including crude oil, passes through the South China Sea. If military tension escalated in the region, the South Korea economy will be severely affected. Korea can never escape from the political military problem between the United States and China in Indo-Pacific. China's military expansion has a very important impact on South Korea's security and economy directly. Korea is a dynamic economic powerhouse located on the geopolitical axis of North Korea, Northeast Asia. Korea should actively engage in political, economy, security, and environmental issues in this region. Now the strategy South Korea must be choose is first to strengthen its solidarity with countries that pursue global value of liberty and democracy and the rule of law. In this regard, it is necessary to actively consider participating in the court. It is also worth considering that Korea joins court and creates the PENPA, a gathering of five countries. Second, based on Black US alliance, is an active cooperation strategy will alliance should be pursued. South Korea maintain a strong alliance with the United States. Based on Black US alliance, it is necessary to develop a strategy of close cooperation with United Nations countries such as United Kingdom, Australia, which participate in the, in the Korean War, and Japan, and the Indo-Pacific countries. The Indo-Pacific region is where the interest of several countries are concerned. Cooperation with the relevant country should be strengthened to ensure freedom of navigation on the high seas. Finally, South Korean military must be expanded military capabilities. As a key member of the United States in the Pacific strategy, it should be built with the naval forces capable of participating in regional state 
responsibility operation and depending national interest. My brief conclusion. The visit of Queen Elizabeth aircraft carrier strike group is the time was an act of action that the United States allied. The United Kingdom would actively work before the stability of the indo pacific In the past, when the Soviet Union tried to move south into Asia, United Kingdom sent the troops to this region to contain the Soviet Union. It shows the importance of cooperation with countries that pursue the global value of liberty and democracy. In particular, the joint exercise with the South Korean Navy in East Sea is very meaningful. A logistic support ship that is part of the carrier strike group is a Korean-made warship. It symbolically shows that the military cooperation between South Korea and the United Kingdom was being carried out successfully. Stability and the freedom of navigation in the Indo-Pacific must be guaranteed. As North Korea continued to threaten nuclear and missile threat, and China continued to expand its military power, cooperation between countries bearing common value is more important than ever for the stability of Northeast Asia and in the Pacific. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, sir. Uh, now we're going to move to the presentation from Captain Kevin Fleming. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kim, and thank you, uh, Admiral Kim, for an excellent um, uh, presentation from the South Korea perspective. Um, I'm, I'm obviously talking from a UK perspective and not just from the from um, uh, a cerebral point of view, but obviously geographic. Um, South Korea and North, the Northeast Asian uh, area is a long way from the UK, and therefore a lot of the UK population either don't aren't familiar with it or it's not high up their agenda um, as we speak. And so the impact and influence of the UK carrier strike group uh, from a UK perspective, uh, I think is slightly different. I think the impact of COVID-19 is inevitably impacted on uh, the uh, on the deployment, not just in uh, the cancellation of the visit of Queen Elizabeth to South Korea, but also many others. And so I think perhaps the opportunity might have been lost from uh, the UK population perspective to bring this to light, bring this to life for, for many people as the carrier strike group has transited from the UK where it left in May uh, all the way out to Guam and it's now uh, uh, starting its return. So uh, the impact I think has definitely been lessened. Uh, that hasn't uh, precluded uh, one of the US, uh, sorry, UK SSNs uh, visiting Busan recently for a logistics stop, but by the very nature of those sorts of platforms, uh, publicity and so on is not uh, usually um, associated with those sorts of visits. Uh, many of the esteemed colleagues on this call have already talked a lot about the geopolitics uh, of the region. Uh, it's worth reminding UK audiences. And of course, whilst we do know we took uh, a very large part in the Korean War, uh, North Korea and South Korea are still technically at war and many um, uh, interactions across the border occur both seen and many unseen. And I think that's an important uh, geopolitical context to bear in mind when you think about going into a region with the size of, of strike group that we have um, to understand the context. And I'll come back to that right at the end. Uh, the importance of China is, is inevitable, both from a trade perspective, from a UK inward trade, uh, and obviously from a, a South Korean perspective, uh, flowing both ways. Uh, and the Admiral has already talked about the vast majority of, of uh, South Korean trade uh, by in the maritime environment. So uh, clearly it, the maritime aspirations of China are important to understand and he set those out. But also understanding the regional history and the regional disputes, some which carry on the North Korea point we talked about, uh, China, which I would put in parentheses, Taiwan, which has obviously been brought out 
with the CPTPP um, news over the uh, over the recent days. Uh, and I think also um, Japan, a very, very close neighbor to uh, strategically for the UK. Um, the UK needs to understand the history between uh, Japan uh, and South Korea just to understand the history, but also the current and future direction of, of regional policies. I think it's it's vital for that. Uh, and as I said, the Republic of Korea is a significant maritime trading nation. So the, the parallels and overlaps with the UK uh, will be uh, absolutely obvious. Uh, but it's also about common allies. Um, the Northeast Asia region, there are many. But then you look into the region, into Southeast Asia, uh, you're then into South China Sea challenges, but then more widely through the Malacca Straits to the Indian Ocean, into the Gulf, the Mediterranean. Uh, and I myself um, spent a very short period of time on a South Korean Navy ship in, alongside in London back in 2015. Uh, it was a real honour and a privilege for me to do that, um, as I've never had the benefit and pleasure of, of visiting your country uh, to do that. Um, but this sense of pride and the uh, fraternity between um, uh, South Koreans and uh, the veterans that we brought on board from the Korean War was, uh, was a wonderful thing to see. And, uh, uh, and I know they really enjoyed that. Talking about trade and prosperity, we've heard Global Britain has been talked about already. Um, I think there is some history, obviously, uh, and there are some future opportunities, perhaps, for both nations. The history already really, uh, alluded to by Admiral Kim, the four Tide class tankers built in South Korea um, uh, between 2014 and 2016. Uh, they were built there, but the tech was added later in the UK, and I'll come back to that in a, in a little bit. Um, the Lynx Wildcat helicopters, both uh, one of which I uh, used to fly in, um, but that may have been overtaken by a recent USC order. So again, these things are never in stone when you're talking about uh, defense industry. Uh, it will depend on politics uh, very often as opposed to capability. So I think that's something worth worth pursuing or thinking about when you think about future strategy. Uh, and the new light carrier mentioned with the F-35B, uh, a recent signature um, between Babcock, a UK um, uh, defense company, uh, with Hyundai. Uh, for building uh, that ship will be interesting to see how that develops. Obviously, it's a long game building something as complex as that. Uh, but clearly, the F-35B that will likely be operated from that uh, that vessel, there are some opportunities there for um, for some collaboration. Looking at the uh, the missions, if you like, and the functions of the of the uh, Korean Navy, there are many similarities with the Royal Navy, and so there are opportunities that that fall from that. Uh, deterrence uh, is key in, in probably more so than met for many other nations in the world. Deterrence is key for for um, South Korea. Um, so the ability to show force is important and also to show who you're allied with. And so the CSG exercising with the Korean Navy, uh, I think, would send a very strong message um, that will will help in the Korean Navy's um, wish to to show deterrence. But then, of course, um, Navies don't exist for themselves. They're there to support foreign policy. And clearly, CSG21 is supporting the UK foreign policy. Um, global Britain and trade uh, has already been mentioned, but also the international uh, rules based system, again, already mentioned and freedom of navigation. CSG, not all of it, uh, only one part of it. A Type 45 destroyer was involved in this uh, in the Black Sea. Uh, and that did get noticed in the UK uh, with the subsequent Russian um, interventions and so on. And I would say that the CSG has not returned home yet. Uh, it's got to go back the way it came, more or less. Uh, and so it will be interesting to see what noise or other activity goes on in the South China Sea uh, on its way back. Uh, but there, the other thing with naval vessels uh, is it's inherent is their ideal for low level engagement and diplomacy. And that happens many, many times. It happened off the coast uh, of South Korea very recently with Queen Elizabeth uh, hosting many uh, influential people from South Korea and I would suggest the region. And it's obviously engaged with other nations uh, as it has, uh, has carried on its deployment. Uh, and the final thing, of course, is the protection of national sovereignty and the maritime interests. Both trading nations both need to keep sea lines of communication open uh, as far as possible. Uh, to allow that global trade upon which everything else uh, really does um, uh, depend. Some of the less politically loaded uh, activities and so on that, that um, can come in terms of future uh, activity could be in the aids of in the area of human, uh, humanitarian aid and disaster relief, um, UN peacekeeping operations, 
Uh, South Korea are very uh, involved in those. These sort of so-called force for good operations uh, are politically safer. Uh, and they also give navies an opportunity to operate together, learn from each other. Uh, and so they develop each other's capability side by side, such that if the more testing environment of war fighting comes along, it's not the first time you've spoken to people. It's not the first time you've met. And this is something that has endured for centuries uh, between navies ar around the world. Uh, but uh, on a slightly lower scale, but no less um, threatening, is the grey zone warfare, if you like, or, and organised criminal activities. So opportunities to engage in counter-terrorism operations, counter-piracy, which South, South Korea Navy has been involved in um, for many years off the Horn of Africa. Uh, these uh, and other uh, criminal activity, arms and people smuggling, these are areas for easy collaboration uh, in terms of uh, doctrine and training opportunities and sharing from experience. Uh, as Admiral Kim has mentioned already, the Royal Navy does have a distinguished history uh, from the Korean War. Uh, over the three years, up to about 15 Royal Navy warships in total were used from light aircraft carriers down to frigates. Uh, and uh, as the Admiral really uh, po pointed out extremely well, the CSG looks really similar to, to the first intervention at the beginning of the Korean War. Um, and so that has not been lost on on me either. Uh, I do think the opportunity to build capacity is really important and I'm not suggesting that this is um, one way or two, uh, one way only uh, because the, the Royal Navy can learn a huge amount from operating in the sea space of the of the of Northeast Asia, South China Sea and the uh, Indo-Pacific region uh, from our Korean allies um, and of course we can also assist in developing um, uh, the Korean doctrine and how they train and so on. Clearly, uh, the, the uh, Korean Navy is hugely influenced by the US Navy. Um, but of course, and it's been mentioned a little bit before, in a post-Afghanistan world, is the US to become a little bit more isolationist? I think it's way too early to say. And obviously, Afghanistan being a land campaign very much supported by, by maritime aviation, but a land campaign maritime forces of course are inherently less engaged less fixed there are possible opportunities perhaps for uk armed forces to get more involved and potentially the rn in particular uh, but that's not to say that the us are going to disappear because they i don't believe they will so and common tasks equals common equipment uk defense industry which is cutting edge korean i would say catching up very rapidly in many of these areas uh, and so i think there are some some opportunities there uh, so looking uh, to sort of close in, in, in a few points, looking beyond CSG 21, will there be a CSG 23, 25, 27 to the region? Uh, is this affordable for the UK and for the RN? Because be under no doubt how expensive this is uh, to deploy such a task group, um, uh, a strike group to the other side of the world. What role for the strike carriers in a post-Afghanistan world? I think that's uh, something for the uh, Royal Navy staff to, to get their heads around. And of course, these strike carriers do need to be escorted and defended. And that would, I would say, there's considerable pain for the Royal Navy to achieve that for this. Um, but let's see what, what goes on. But it is also an excellent opportunity for um, collaboration, multinational collaboration. And perhaps we may see uh, a Korean uh, air defense destroyer escorting a carrier strike group uh, in the future. I think that would be an excellent, um, uh, an excellent opportunity to move to move that forward in the in the way that the US and the Dutch have done for CSG 21. Uh, Admiral Kim mentioned the two river class patrol vessels that will be deployed to the region and will remain there for at least five years. Uh, it's a more enduring pair presence. There's no assigned base, so they are inherently flexible depending they can go from the Bering Straits down to Antarctica at a large piece of ocean, um, but they can still uh, they can still do that. One of the attributes of maritime uh, maritime power. But no disrespect to these uh, warships, they are small, less capable and less impactful. But I do think that time is, is a really powerful um, way of building re uh, relationships. Um, so I don't think they should be underestimated. And then the final thing uh, which has come as a little bit of a shock to most is the AUKUS um, impact. Very new, full detail, really not yet known. But I have seen it discussed that there may be the opportunity to base a, a Royal Navy nuclear powered submarine in Australia. Um, how that might affect the regional balance will be interesting to see. How it would affect actually the EU or the European interaction in the region, uh, resulting from the considerable French upset 
But I personally hope that will be short lived and we can get back to uh, get back to more cordial relations uh, sometime soon. But I wouldn't underestimate the, the potential impact for that. So to sort of answer uh, impact, I think COVID-19 has had a considerable negative effect on what would have been a highly impactful uh, deployment and a highly impactful opportunity for UK uh, South Korean uh, strategic relations. And of course, I would say that CSG 21 is not over yet. So let's not um, let's not answer that question fully. Um, and the uh, the defence, um, uh, the integrative review rather from last year did talk about a UK Indo-Pacific tilt and it sort of seems to be happening. But is it a one off? Perhaps it's a, a, what we would say a flash in the pan. Apologies for using the colloquial phrases there, but I think you'll get my my drift. Does the AUKUS, does the OPV deployment, does the SSN basing signify a real change uh, or is it just window dressing? Is it just trying to kickstart global Britain and trade post leaving the EU? Uh, and this will be beneficial to UK defence industry, perhaps. Or does it herald a strategic longer term, properly resourced shift for the UK? I'll just end with a couple of things. One is a quote from Commodore Steve Morehouse, who's the commander of the carrier strike group itself. CSG 21 has taken us from the Atlantic Ocean through the Mediterranean, across the Indian Ocean and has brought us here to the Western Pacific for a series of exercises, engagements with regional partners, including the Republic of Korea. The UK, like the Republic of Korea, is an outward looking trading nation committed to contributing to the maritime security which underpins global prosperity. By sailing here, we make clear our determination to work with like minded nations in support of an open and transparent system of international rules. Our aim is to strengthen the ties between our two countries and pave the way for closer cooperation in the future. So it feels there's lots of ticks, lots of positives in that. Uh, but I would just like to say for the UK and for the Royal Navy, perhaps, I think the chance of a miscalculation in a region where they've not been properly engaged for many decades, actually over half a century uh, in defence and security matters, I think poses a considerable risk. There's an urgent need, I think, for the UK to rapidly improve and develop their understanding of the complexities inherent in this region. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. I think now uh, we are we're going to move to the Q&A session. So uh, both Professor Greg uh, Kennedy and I agreed that we'll have the collective Q&A session because everything is all connected. And, and uh, over to you, Professor Kennedy. Thank you, brilliant. Um, I'll go in the order of, of which I have noticed the questions coming through and I noticed, you know, obviously, uh, Larry, you and myself, we definitely have got questions and I'm sure you guys have got questions for one another amongst the panelists, but I'd like to bring some of the audience in here right off the bat. And so for uh, Ramon and Dr. Shin, we've got a question on, uh, I don't know if, if you can see it over in the, the chat. We're witnessing shift of Britain's strategic focus towards Indo-Pacific region. The recent voyage of the Queen Elizabeth Carrier Group and creation of AUKUS coalition with Australia are good examples. It's noteworthy that Britain's action is proceeding even conflict with Russia is getting worse since the mid 2010s. So how would it be interpreted? How is this going to be seen? Does Britain believe that conflict with Moscow is manageable? So the question is about uh, the Russian influence in the region or despite tension with Russia, engaging in the Indo-Pacific is worth a new cornerstone for global Britain, including a stronger alliance with the United States, which is a really good question, which I think speaks to a number of the topics that were brought out here, which is this pull. Is the UK uh, European slash North Atlantic state still, or is it going to have to refocus its uh, attentions to the Indo-Pacific? So Dr. Shin, Ramon, have you got some things you would like to address to that? Um, who should go first? Uh, Dr. Chin, you want to go first? Or well, I, I can take it. I can, go I, ahead, I can Ramon. I don't know then. if yep, Dr. Sure. Chin can hear us. Yeah, perfect. So, I yes, I don't think it's that the Russian, that Russia is perceived as less of a threat, but that China is perceived as, as, as more of a threat than, than in the past. And I think it's quite remarkable. This change had 
started already a few years ago, but I think with the pandemic has really accelerated. Uh, it has been seen, in my view, in the UK as 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 um, China misbehaving due to secrecy at the same time as it is becoming more assertive, not only in the region, not only in the Indo-Pacific region, but also more assertive in, 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 in Europe as, uh, as well and trying to have more influence, right? So we have seen all this wolf warrior diplomacy and, and we have seen, for example, the, the Chinese ambassador to, to the UK uh, openly criticizing the, the country in a very undiplomatic way. And not, not only in the UK, we have seen this in, in, in Sweden, in France, in different European countries. We have seen sanctions on, on, on individuals for, for, from different European countries as well being imposed by, by China, including MPs, for example, in the case of, of, of the UK. So I, I think that the shift, uh, there is the component that the question refers to, which is the fact that the US is really asking the UK uh, and other European countries really to be more involved in the Indo-Pacific. And I think uh, UK is, is, is top of the list with, with AUKUS, right? Um, but um, there's also the change in perception within, uh, within the UK and the discourse about China is very different. Uh, and I would say even more in the, in the past, China was not really a political, much of a political issue uh, in, in the UK beyond certain circles, but now it has become an issue that is discussed open in the media, that different civil society groups are trying to influence the policy towards China. And uh, many of these groups have a, have a, diff, uh, um, a negative view towards China. So, so I, I don't think it's about change uh, trust, threat perception uh, with, in relation to Russia, but change threat perception in relation to China and the view that this is a threat that the UK has to be involved in, 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 in managing. And there is a, a, another issue as well, which is uh, Asian countries are actually asking the UK uh, and other European countries actually to become more involved in, 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 in the region. Uh, Japan and India are doing this very openly, Australia, of course, as well, if we look at the Indo-Pacific. But Korea has started to do this as well, not openly, uh, more quietly, but the current government has actually been trying to strengthen cooperation with, with um, uh, European countries in trying to manage uh, the, 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 the threat coming from, from, from China. So I think it's more about this rather than, than Russia itself. Uh, the way we perceive China has really changed in recent years. Okay, thank you. Dr. Shin. I think there is a certain stage when we engage with China. I, I, I hope I welcome the European engagement on China issue. Uh, we, make, we do make a great contribution because at this moment, there is a strategic competition between US and China. And, uh, but unfortunately, United States alone cannot handle China. So we need uh, some support from uh, international community. I think the biggest power can come from uh, European countries. So that that can change China's perception and diplomatic direction, I believe. Although China at this moment, China tried to appear strong. However, inside China, there will be a many uh, kind of a discussion and uh, uh, confrontation uh, group by group, I believe. So I think uh, the European engagement on China issue is, uh, 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 will be welcomed, uh, not only from the United States, but also country in the uh, Indo-Pacific region, including South Korea. With regard to uh, the uh, de-escalation mechanism, uh, we do not have a such kind of a mechanism at this moment, but uh, fortunately, I believe that uh, salt, uh, current level of uh, competition between US and China is not up to military level. And it's uh, probably up to economic level and political and diplomatic level. So uh, if we uh, work together, I mean, the we means the United States and European countries and the country in the Indo-Pacific region, and then there will be a strong uh, de-escalation mechanism that can persuade China. That's my answer. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to take and 
move down to uh, questions from Brigadier General Shim, and he's asked about AUKUS, and I think we need to, to probably address the AUKUS elephant in the room. So for the uh, other panelists, for Admiral Kim, Kevin, and Professor Ahn, the two parts to the question, uh, does any imp uh, what's the impact of AUKUS on NATO? And certainly uh, Ramon and Dr. Shin, feel free to, to jump in as well. And the second question is, do you believe that AUKUS may be influential in economic issues then within the wider Indo-Pacific area or even in terms globally? Will this have uh, a knock-on effect? And I think this, this does speak to something that's quite clear in terms of, of the presentations here today is in terms of this messaging and signaling and how is it that the sorts of communications that all of these activities are supposed to represent, as, as Dr. Shin just alluded to, which one is prime? Which one is more important? Is it economic activity or is it the diplomacy tied to the military activity and actions? And how do you know just exactly who's perceiving what? So I'd be very interested to get the views of our panelists uh, on Dr. Uh, on Brigadier Shim's questions about this AUKUS kind of ripple. Uh, go ahead, Professor An. Well, uh, in my opinion, AUKUS situation uh, seems to suggest that, uh, well, in this part of reason, the security uh, concern uh, seems to dominate, uh, especially uh, among some key strategic allies. Um, well, globally now, well, the, the clear distinction between Trump administration versus Biden administration is the, the President Trump basically focused on the trade deficit issue and it, uh, try to run after China. But when he tried to uh, went after trade deficit problem, suddenly it had to target other strategic ally countries, many European countries, uh, Japan, Korea, and so forth. But President Biden now tried to go deeper. Uh, actually, the more, the fundamental problem is the industry competitiveness, but uh, behind the industry competitiveness, we have technology competitiveness. So suddenly trade, the, the technology and securities are all integrated as just strategic uh, factors. Uh, and then as, as you uh, are well aware now, the trans-Atlantic uh, uh, solidarity tried to be rebuilt. And then uh, probably for most important uh, the restabilization of the global uh, order is probably the strengthening the relation between the, the EU, UK versus uh, the United States. Uh, but then suddenly AUKUS <laughs> tried to uh, separate and divide its strategic partners and then <laughs> try to highlight uh, this issue. So, um, well, uh, it, it, it seems to me that uh, uh, in this particular AUKUS initiative, try to go after more strategic, the security uh, concern that is unique for, for this particular issue. Um, uh, but other than that, probably economically speaking, uh, now supply chain re, uh, reshuffling uh, are uh, very strongly pushed uh, by Biden administration, that actually uh, uh, pressure not just China to react, but also EU and Japan and Taiwan and Korea. So uh, in terms of the supply chain, uh, the rearrangement, the, the, the whole global trade order appears to be balkanized now. Um, but uh, the, the AUKUS situation, <laughs> I don't know how it, it, it can be um, uh, it, it, it can it can cause more trouble. Uh, but uh, from what I read now is 
uh, U.S. government desperately tried to appease the friends and try to calm down the current situation. So we, we should see whether uh, this current situation may have uh, the broader implication or it is just one kind of episode. Uh, yeah. Yes, Admiral Kim. Yeah, so uh, this kind of issue is very interesting for about Korean also. So security and economy. The security is a survival issue. Survival issue or live or die. Economic issue is a hungry or not hungry. So our Korean case also too, we choose first, security issue is first. Australia is also so contain the Chinese expanding maritime power and the joining the United States the alliance. So alliance is very important thing for about the security problem. Korea is also too. Uh, this uh, kind of situation is also the Australia and United States very strong type for the alliance membership then. So I think maybe in the future, so Korea in the same case, we develop that. Thank you. Thank you. Kev? Yeah, so just uh, taking the two pieces about the de-escalation uh, mechanism first, I think um, my point about we need to understand the, the region in a much greater way to avoid uh, miscalculation, um, because then you can avoid, if you like, escalating uh, in a, an inappropriate or an out of control way. I always think back to the Cuba missile crisis and uh, uh, and how that could have gone, obviously, uh, very badly wrong. Um, but the opportunity to discuss and talk and engage is really important. So I think rather than there being a de-escalation mechanism, I think continued dialogue is absolutely vital, be that with China, be that with Russia, be that with any uh, uh, nation, including, of course, North Korea in this in this context. So I think that's uh, an opportunity there. In terms of how uh, AUKUS might affect NATO, I think is really interesting. There's been more discussion already about a European uh, armed forces or a European army, which the UK has always been extremely opposed to because it was seen as duplicating NATO. But if NATO, um, which is a military alliance, um, uh, starts to become used more politically and AUKUS feels to me, whilst there is an underlying um, military capability uh, at the heart of it, the nuclear powered submarines. It feels political from my perspective. From a UK perspective, it's an opportunity to uh, for global Britain to look elsewhere apart from to, to Europe. Um, for the uh, Australians, it's trying to, I think, maybe show a bit more clear water between their allies, um, uh, their, their geographical allies in New Zealand. And again, uh, the United States and Canada seem to be uh, more often at loggerheads in terms of policy um, than in term, uh, than than they were in the past. So, to me, at the moment, AUKUS, apart from the headline, which was the nuclear submarines, uh, it feels politics at the moment. But I think there's a lot more to play out and see how that uh, how that develops. Brilliant. Thanks. Uh, I want to. I mean, obviously. Uh... Ramon, Dr. Shin, if you want to come on to any of that, then please do. But I wanted to then present uh, the question about <clears throat> the role of Africa. So how far does this Indo-Pacific and how far actually does the idea of connect connectivity and maybe collaboration and this idea of commonality of view does, um, say, rock views of the development of Africa or the role of Africa within the greater Indo-Pacific security question fit with the UK? Or you know, are there things that actually are, are more problematic for that? So I'm not sure who might want to have anybody. Yeah, Dr. Shin, excellent. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. With regard to Africa, I think uh, that's uh, too far from Korean Peninsula, but uh, South Korean diplomacy, we have a kind of a feeling and tendency and policy that uh, South Korea must uh, make a contribution on international peace. Uh, so uh, usually with regard to African security, uh, our approach is uh, peacemaking or peace building uh, approach there. 
and make a contribution. That's our perception. But uh, we do not uh, directly link African contribution on Indo-Pacific area, especially with regard to the China. That's uh, out of our antenna, I think. And then another question is, uh, of course, I think this is a kind of a consideration of United States and UK and Australia, because United States want to wanted to build a strong network, strong military network that can cope with China. However, uh, the Quad itself is, uh, has uh, many problems to uh, develop as a military organization or because the Indians, uh, India's position. India is a very unique position. They do not want to uh, military confrontation with China, although they fear some rivalry, strong rivalry against China, but with regard to the military cooperation, they step away. Japan has another uh, limitation because of uh, it's a const constitutional limitation or their, their budgetary issue. They do not actively uh, link uh, uh, the, the, the alliance mechanism. Uh, so I think the, the alternative approach is uh, AUKUS because uh, they, have a, they have a same value same uh, strategic interest, and then same uh, military uh, uh, strategy, I think. So it's uh, another one. So from US perspective, they try to make a various, a various group of cooperation as, a, uh, for example, AUKUS is military, Quad is kind of a strategy cooperation, or Five Eyes to Nine Eyes, it's a intelligence uh, cooperation among uh, 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 allies and partners and others uh, so CPTPP is an economic partnership. So uh, from US perspective, uh, they wanted to build these kind of various uh, organization to cope with China. From South Korea view, I think uh, from at this moment, current stage, uh, it is very difficult to join the AUKUS. If we get invited, even if we get invited, because as, uh, as, as, uh, we probably prefer to uh, make a bilateral alliance to focus on the North Korean issue, then China issue is not a liberable alliance, but the security cooperation percept, we might, uh, we will cooperate the US uh, strategy. Uh, with regard to economy, as uh, Professor Han know better than me, but anyway, we probably change our position to join CPTPP, maybe next to government, I think. Uh, so, the, so, so the group is different, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I'm conscious of the time and, and you guys have been at this for quite a while and, and the time zone differences and where everybody is. Right. So I, I, want to, I want to bring, <clears throat> And I think Larry Monaco's question about Japan is quite good in order to bring a number of these different uh, threads together, because we've talked about the United States, the Australians, China a lot. But this question about now whether or not the, the, the point that Professor An raised about the agreement for the first time with Japan, this could be quite fundamentally important to shifting the kinds of perceptions of balance of power in the region if you actually had a consolidated Korean Japanese axis. And I just wanted to get all the panelists um, kind of views on whether or not this is the beginning of something that you think is actually sustainable. And I suppose the other part of that question is whether or not the growth of a South Korean Japanese axis is actually stabilizing or whether or not the perception of such an axis could be more destabilizing than it could be stabilizing for security in the region. I know it's a real big question. So <laughs> your, your points on this and maybe for uh, and the next conversation we have. So I'll start uh, down at the top, well, my, my screen at the top and Professor An, can you start us off with that, please? Well, this is a really uh, big question. <laughs> I need to spend a long time, but... Uh... Very briefly, um, well, this part of the world, actually the Korea, Japan, and uh, China 
for a long time talked about like East Asian economic cooperation for, uh, or e even East Asian economic integrations. So that uh, terminology description has been kind of the very famous political agenda uh, for a long time here. But nowadays it completely disappeared. In fact, uh, on the one hand, it looked like we have RCEP, we have many FTAs. So economically, we are more and more integrated uh, with each other. But uh, as you hinted, because of the thought, uh, because of uh, the Senkaku, uh, the, the, the dispute uh, between Korea and China, uh, Japan and Korea, uh, the China versus Japan, these countries have more and more political problem that actually uh, go be, to beyond the political issue. So even, well, for a long time, this part of what happened was when we have some kind of political diplomatic issue, uh, that becomes too serious, then economic or industry uh, coalitions actually worked and then tried to calm down. But nowadays it was actually reversed. Uh, so, uh, the economic and uh, the business coalition have been seriously disturbed now. So it is no longer working to stabilize the, the national relationship uh, against each other. So that is the big danger. Economically speaking, actually many economists, even OECD show that the trade costs among these countries in terms of the bilateral trade has been significantly increased uh, during the past decade. So uh, that is the reality of what is happening here. Uh, so uh, we have a lot of issue. We have to be very cautious. Uh, if we try to broadly aggregate something, then the situation will not be resolved. You, you have to look into very closely between Korea and Japan, between Korea and China, and uh, China versus uh, Japan. That's yeah. the only thing I can say <laughs> in short <laughs> sentences. <laughs> Economics is not everything. Exactly. Thank you. Ramon, you want to give it a go? Yeah, yeah sure. I mean, I, I think there are the, the politics of it, and obviously political relations uh, uh, between Korea and Japan have deteriorated in these uh, recent years. Uh, but then there's the reality on, on, on the ground. And I mean, the, the different uh, ministries continue to cooperate, like, for example, uh, the ministries of foreign affairs and, and the ministries of, of, of defense. Sometimes, I mean, I compare it with the with, uh, UK and France, right? Sometimes the politics of the UK French relationship is not good. And clearly, this past week has been very bad <laughs> with, with the, the announcement, of, announcement of focus. But there is a lot of cooperation still going on. This, does, this is not going to make the headlines because it's more regular cooperation, including in the case of France and the UK between the two uh, militaries, right? Uh, and I think it's similar for the case of, of Korean Japan that there is cooperation going on that is not going to make the headlines, it's not going to play into politics because with the, uh, in, in, in Seoul or in Tokyo, it wouldn't help the, the governments that are currently in, in, in power. And of course, we have elections coming up, but uh, in, in both countries, but there is cooperation uh, taking place. And I, I recall uh, as an anecdote just uh, l l last year, uh, I think it was when there was another spat between Korea and Japan. Uh, and then the two of them were conducting joint uh, exercises in the Gulf of Aden. Uh, together with European navies. This didn't make the headlines, but that you had the two navies <laughs> cooperating with each other while politicians were uh, basically playing to the domestic audiences. And, and I think that's important to emphasize as well in the Korea-Japan relationship. Yes, <clears throat> perception is reality. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Admiral Kim. Yes, sir. Your, your thoughts on the enduring ability of the Korean-Japan alliance to, to continue to move forward and whether it's a good or not good thing for the region. The always is Korean-Japan is a relationship is very sensitive one because of those many nationalism and, uh, and geographically the dispute and something like that. At especially for each politician group, they use their domestic politics for the 
Korean Japan relations. So many things, many kinds of things we already had in the Japan and Korea. Fundamentally, the Korea and Japan to make a good relationship is, is nice, it's good. Every people wants to be. But the historical problem, so the island, the doctor island is mean, the problem is some critical point is issue. If this issue is, comes up, two countries for people for the other position, this is big problem for the Korea and Japan relations. And so many, the politicians, this kind of things use in the, their domestic politics. This is problem we are. Thank you. Good, thank you. Kev, what do you think the odds are with the Prince of Wales escorted by a uh, rock anti-aircraft frigate and the uh, Aegis Japanese cruiser. Well, I, I'm a I'm a possibilist, so I think that is possible. Uh, absolutely, uh, as Ramon has said, there is so much that goes on at sea uh, between nations that is just not seen. Um, it's not hidden; it just is not looked for by many many nations. So I see that as a as a distinct possibility, uh, and I would hope that it would occur because. By understanding each other's capabilities and so on, I think I think um, uh, security is enhanced. Uh, I won't I won't comment on Japan Korea history. I'm aware of some of it, but not an expert, so I won't comment on that. But I just like to say a bit about maybe balance of power and the calculations that people make when they are looking at at new um, relationships or new agreements. So AUKUS came out of left field. Nobody saw that coming, uh, apart from the three nations. And so I think people are still getting their head around what it actually means. Is it is it a security? Is it political? Is it a bit of both? It's probably a bit of both. And there's economics underpinning that because of defense industry and so on. Um, selling eight nuclear powered submarines is is pretty lucrative for the seller. So so I think when people start to look at what AUKUS means in looking forward, I think there will be a better understanding. But people looking from the outside in will have to make a calculation. They'll have to make a calculation as to what risks or threats to them will exist once this relationship becomes stronger. Um, and so if there's a Korea-Japan relationship that becomes stronger in the region, other players are going to make a, uh, an, a, a, an assessment of the um, relative threat to them as per the status quo before and after and to see what occurs from that. So I think there's a balance of power. Uh, it, it's sort of an underpinning um, doctrinal thinking about what balance of power means. It depends how quickly and how strong the actual um, uh, agreements that are made in AUKUS in this instance, or Japan, South Korea uh, in the future, depends on how that's perceived. As you said, Greg, perception is reality. Thanks. Dr. Uh, Shin. Oh, excuse me. Uh, hold on just a minute. Um, uh, before Professor Shin uh, makes comment, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Greg. Professor An needs to uh, leave for the next meeting. Uh, so maybe we could farewell to him and Professor An. We would like to invite you for another session later if you are scheduled to meet. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, thank you very much for attending. I'm that. very sorry for leaving early. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Hamzamida. Thank you. So we will give the last My word girl? on this to the yeah. yes. It's a very tricky issue. You know, most difficult uh, the di diplomatic question in Korea is the Korea Japan relations. Every government, whether they is a conservative, progressive, they made the, the national agenda, diplomatic agenda. They always mention two track approach. One is uh, they're going to solve history issue, one thing, and then economic cooperation, another. However, uh, if they uh, become an incumbent power, they, they just uh, deal with the Japan issue based upon domestic politics. It's very difficult uh, because it's a very volatile. No, uh, 
the problem, fundamental problem is uh, Japan is changed. You know, the, the, those uh, generation who broke uh, World War II is a current generation's grandfather and the grandfather's father. You know, you know current uh, 20, 30s, Japanese people do not feel any sorry to South Korean. That's a reality. But South Korea cannot perceive that kind of change in perception in uh, Japan. So we always demand uh, Japan's apology. But Jap from Japan's perspective, it's an old story. So it's very difficult to solve a history issue. However, because of the Chinese rise, Chinese uh, hostile rise, assertive rise, there is a kind of a certain voices that Korea, Japan, Thai must get stronger. So I think um, it's not easy one, but uh, as time goes by, as, uh, China, as we notice uh, Chinese assertive behavior more and more, then there is a room for Korea, Japan security cooperation, even more military cooperation, but it's not now. That's my understanding. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that your <clears throat> discussions here today more than uh, validate why it is that uh, the Center for Asia Pacific Strategy and our center need to continue to work closely together. And I think um, this first this first attempt at an annual event to to link up the two centers and certainly the perspectives of Europe, North America, and uh, the Asia Pacific is something that uh, we we certainly will will want to continue to uh, to carry on. So, thank you thank you all very much. Um, Ian, would you like to to say anything? In well, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the great discussion. And like you just said, Professor Kennedy, I think more and more that we really need to meet in person. And there are a lot to talk about in detail. And but, uh, there are different perspectives in, in different nations. But I think I see one, one in common that everybody wants to cooperate, but in a, in a, uh, more constructive uh, way. It's, a, it's not about the, the, the cooperation itself. I think we all seek for how we conduct it in what format. Uh, so I wish we could um, meet again for the next event. And I just wanna thank you very much for the discussion and, and all your staff's work uh, from King's College London Corbett Center. <laughs> That's it for me. Thank you. And thank you, yes, thank you everyone, all the panelists for all of your time and the energies and the efforts to, to help us here today to, to get this inaugural event off. And yes, definitely I think that uh, when it's allowed face-to-face -face and continuing to be able to break these kinds of uh, groups into closer discussions around things will certainly be in the future. So thank you to all of you. Kamsamtida. And uh, be well, be safe out there. Okay. So have good night and have a good day. Bye. Yes. Good night. Good morning. Thank good afternoon. It's good night here. Yeah. And yeah. there's a good afternoon for them. Yeah. Thank you. Take care. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.